This is Dan Schneider. This is the second in a series of American television shows by the decade that I'm doing with Mitchell Hadley. Uh, our first show a couple of months ago was called To the 1940s, meaning everything from before up until the end of the 40s. This show will focus on the decade of the 1950s. Before we get started, though, uh, Mitch, if you could just give a little background about yourself and then we'll get going. Hi, Dan. Uh, yes, you can uh, find me at the website itsabouttv.com, and for the last 13 years I've written about the evolution of American culture and American history through the lens of classic television, in particular how television reflects, interprets, influences, and is influenced by it. I'm uh, the author of three books, including two works of fiction, and the book The Electronic Mirror, what classic television tells us about who we were and who we are and everything in between. And my new book, which I'm hoping will be out next year, is called The Descent into Hell, How Classic Television Warned Us About Today's Brave New World of Alienation, Fear, and Totalitarianism. So, in our last show, as we ended the 1940s, uh, the 40s were in a sense a carryover from radio. A lot of the television shows from that era uh, were just extensions, visual extensions of radio shows that were already extant. You had uh, a lot of the variety shows. You had people like Groucho Marx and Jack Benny coming over from radio. Um, so by the time we get to 1950 though, the medium was sort of becoming its own. Uh, there were stars being uh, put out that didn't do that well on radio or in film, but became big on television. So let's talk about some of those trends like that. What are some of the more notable trends mm -hmm. as we turn mid-century? Okay, well, as we enter the decade of the 50s, 9% of American households have televisions. So it's gotten slightly beyond just a very special thing that a very select few had, but it's still just 9%, and most of those homes are concentrated in the Northeast, which means as the decade starts, you still have an emphasis on live television from New York, utilizing stage talent from Broadway and young actors who are just coming up. But um, over, the, over the course of the decade, you see an evolution in how television is going. You'll see uh, more involvement by the Hollywood studios, which means that gradually the uh, gravity, the center of gravity in television is going to move from New York to Hollywood. You're going to see film replace videotape. You're going to see sitcoms and dramas replace anthology shows. You're going to see live programming all but end by the end of the 50s. And you're going to see, as you mentioned, an emphasis on homegrown talent, on people who are television stars, not uh, former movie stars, not former radio stars, but people who've come up completely through television. And I think um, one of the interesting places to start with that is right at the beginning with Milton Berle, even though he had started in the 40s and he had gotten his entertainment start in vaudeville and then in radio he'd never been a big star in radio he was a presence but he wasn't a big star so he became the first genuine television star when he went on texaco star theater in the late 40s into the early 50s uh, so much uh, so that he was known as mr television and people bought televisions to watch him, people stayed home from the movies to watch him. He had a very unique visual style that made him perfect for TV, whereas that just hadn't worked very well on the radio. So you'll see someone like Burl come in. You'll see someone like Jackie Gleason, who started with the Dumont Network and then wound up moving over to uh, CBS, where he had a long run. But Gleason was another star who um, didn't really have a great presence until he went on television. And in fact, it was television that gave him the presence later on in the movies and in records and in different media like that. So 
you have these homegrown stars, Lucille Ball, for that matter. I mean, Lucy had been on radio. She had a very successful show on radio called My Favorite Husband, and she had acted in the movies, never in in huge roles, but she was a known quantity, and yet there was no preparation for the way she exploded onto the screen with Desi Arnaz, her husband, in I Love Lucy. And that, that again, became... A, it, it was based on My Favorite Husband, but it became a phenomenon on television. And this is what we'll see throughout the 50s. We'll see the, the growth of the variety show and the hosts who appear on there and become stars in their own right. And we'll see the growth of uh, shows originated for television. You still have shows that are crossing over from radio. Dragnet is a good example. Very long and successful radio run, even longer and successful uh, TV run. But you'll see television start to mature as a medium of its own, rather than one that is just evolving or picking up the pieces from other media. I'm just looking at a list of the top ten shows of 1950 from a, uh, a website called RetroWaste.com. So number one, they have Texaco Star Theater, NBC. Two, Fireside Theater, NBC. Three, Philco TV Playhouse, NBC. Four, Your Show of Shows, NBC. Colgate Comedy Hour, NBC, Gillette Cavalcade of Sports, NBC, and then Arthur Godfrey down at number eight, Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts with CBS. So it seems that NBC was the dominant network uh, mm -hmm. out of the gate, um, but also a whole mishmash of uh, variety and uh, uh, other kinds of things were, were dominant with like eight of the, or seven of the top ten spots. Yeah, it's very interesting to see how that goes. Uh, you mentioned uh, some of the shows like Fireside Theater, Philco TV Playhouse. You still had at the beginning of the decade that core of dramatic anthologies that were being done live from New York. And I think that um, that, will, that will continue through the first part of the 50s. But Colgate Comedy Hour is a great example of... Uh, nurturing talent for the new medium. Here you had a show with a revolving set of hosts. It was, as the title suggests, a variety comedy show, but the most famous hosts that the show had were Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. They were well known, they'd been very successful in nightclubs, but they really hit a peak when they come on TV. They have great chemistry, you have Jerry emerging is really a comic genius, very physical, very wacky. You have Dean, on the other hand, great voice, very smooth singer, perfect straight man. And the two of them together really click. And um, even though they are not permanent hosts of Comedy Hour, they're, again, they're just revolving hosts, but they become most closely identified with the Colgate Comedy Hour. And Comedy Hour was up against the Ed Sullivan Show, which was known in the first few years there as, um, gosh, I, um, I, I talk of the town, or toast of the town. Uh, before it was named after Sullivan. And so those two shows were going head-to-head, -head, same time slot most of the time. You were seeing a great amount of talent between those two shows, and you're, you're seeing in a, uh, right there the dichotomy in the kinds of variety shows. Colgate is a sketch comedy featuring uh, primarily whoever the stars, the hosts are with guests, then you have Sullivan on the other hand. Sullivan, strictly a host, very little involvement in the show itself, very wooden presence, which becomes his trademark, but the focus there is on the talent, on his guests, and anybody who wants to make it in television, make it in the business, is on Sullivan. Those are two great examples of the kinds of variety shows we see. But you, as you mentioned, most of these shows, not all of them, but most of them are on NBC. They've got a visionary head of NBC, Pat Weaver, who has really invested himself and the company in this medium of television. And throughout his time at um, 
at NBC, he's going to be noted for creating the Today Show, creating the Tonight Show, um, creating the concept of the special, which he called a spectacular, and uh, really starting to understand what could happen with the new medium. Um, the, uh, some of the other things you were mentioning, Cavalcade of Sports on, uh, on NBC. Again, that shows how important sports has been from the very beginning on television. I think we talked a little bit when we were uh, talking about the 40s about the first two great sports that were on TV, boxing and wrestling. And uh, again, perfect sports. for the. They required very little in the way of technical coverage, square uh, ring, middle of the screen, two or three cameras. Um, in wrestling, you have these outgoing personalities. You have good guys and bad guys. Perfect morality play being played out in the squared circle. So you've got, uh, you've got a real foundation of seeing where television and sports have a connection from the very beginning. Those were also two sports that did not particularly feel threatened by the impact of television. Baseball, uh, which becomes probably the next major sport to be on TV, is a little different because baseball owners are suspicious about television. They're worried that TV will take away from the box office, that people will not be going live to the stadium if they can sit back and watch television and see the game there. So. Uh, there's there's a, um, an interesting fundamental relationship between television and baseball. Even talking about the doubts that owners had, by the mid-50s, there's, there's a lot of baseball on TV. There's a game of the week. The local teams are broadcasting almost all of their home games, at least in the New York area, on television. And the prospect of television is also starting to draw attention to an area of the country that has been underserved by baseball, by Major League Baseball. That's the West Coast. So by the end of the decade, you've got teams in San Francisco and Los Angeles. You have the western edge of baseball moving out. You have teams in in uh, Kansas City now. You have this expansion toward the West, and I think that that was an understanding that TV could really play a powerful role in the growth of the sport. Football, you have college football, which is the giant of football at that point in time. NFL is really kind of an afterthought. Players who play for pay aren't that highly esteemed, and as a matter of fact, the first national TV that uh, the NFL had, I think, was on Dumont. So um, t uh, football and TV don't really make a mix until the late 50s. I think it's 1957 or 58 when the Colts and the Giants play the sudden death championship game that football, pro football, becomes a thing on television. College football has been fine. You had the Rose Bowl every year. You had other games as well. But that's where pro football begins to enter the scene as well. Um, looking at 1951, uh, there's an interesting trend in the top ten. But before I, I, we get to the, the overall trend, I noticed that Arthur Godfrey had a second mm. show in the top ten. So there was Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts at number one, and then Arthur Godfrey and his friends at number six. Yeah. And it makes me think because... Uh, as far as I can recall, this was before my time, Arthur Godfrey's shows differed from Sullivan's and other variety shows in that Sullivan had a variety of already established with some up-and-comers. Godfrey's show was famously parodied 20 years later with The Gong Show. You know, he, he mostly had, uh, you know, a lot of people, oh, this is uh, Jose, he, he plays the spoons from the, you know, off the street. He had a lot more corny uh, but a lot more real i guess it's i guess now you would call like america's got talent uh, kind of thing um so talk about the difference between godfrey mm -hmm. and sullivan as hosts and their shows if you would sure well, well godfrey first of all had um 
had a presence. He was a great entertainer because he was a great personality. He wasn't a great singer. He played the ukulele. But Godfrey, Godfrey had a folksy image. He uh, was brilliant on radio, one of the great radio salesmen for a product. He'd actually um, become most prominent in 1945 when he was doing some of the news coverage for the funeral of uh, President Roosevelt and was describing the cortege coming down uh, Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington. So Godfrey came in through radio, and um, you're, you're right, he had a group that he called the four the, the foundation of his show was around a group called the little godfreys and the little godfreys included uh, julius la rosa the mcguire sisters uh, some other entertainers later on pat boone was one of the little godfreys and between that regular core of regulars and talent scouts which uh, introduced some some great talent but also uh, appealed to just the everyman in terms of discovering talent. Godfrey had a real connection with the audience. People loved Godfrey. Um, Sullivan, on the other hand, is is a, a theater critic, a Broadway a columnist, knows talent inside and out but as i said talking about him being wooden he has no presence on stage and eventually that very lack of presence becomes his presence his trademark uh but but um sullivan has big name talent he also has a lot of vaudeville talent acts that we wouldn't see in the years to come, or we wouldn't we wouldn't see them on a lot of shows. He had Senor Wences, the ventriloquist, with the uh, with with the the talking hand puppet, and he had uh, Topo Gijo, the little mouse. But he also had the biggest names and talent. As we get into the '60s, have the biggest rock stars on uh, the show. But he, he introduces Elvis in the 50s. He introduces the Beatles in the 60s. Now, I know somebody is out there is going to say, well, he didn't introduce the Beatles, or um, Elvis, and that's true. Elvis was on other shows before he was on Sullivan, but it's Sullivan that people remember because it's Sullivan that counts. So I, I think that, you know, if you're looking for a really short, difference between Godfrey and Sullivan, I would say that Godfrey is the down-home, aw shucks, folksy, new talent, core of uh, regulars. Sullivan is the mix of vaudeville and big names, star maker, star reflector. If you make it on Sullivan, your career is on its way. Um, so... 1951, we had number one, Talent Scouts, Texaco Star Theater. Number three, I Love Lucy is the first sitcom that seems to really become a powerhouse. Number mm -hmm. three, Red Skelton Show, and I think that was a variety show. That wasn't a sitcom. Yes, that's uh, correct. Then we have Colgate Comedy, Arthur Godfrey and His Friends, Fireside Theater, Your Show a Show, which is Sid Caesar and Imogene Coca. Mm -hmm. Jack Benny is the only other sitcom uh, on there. And then You Bet Your Life, the Groucho Show, uh, which came over from radio. So we talked about uh, about the difference uh, between Godfrey and and uh, uh, Sullivan. Let's let's look at the two people that you mentioned, uh, Lucille Ball and Jackie Gleason. And I use them because they're about a generation later uh, than uh, Burl, and they're mm -hmm. in a sense the second way they established sitcoms. Now I love Lucy. Uh, a lot of technical innovations, and it's a juggernaut in the ratings. Uh, but yet, I think now, for some reason, even though the characters of the honeymoon has started out on on Jackie Gleason's own variety show, when people think of the 1950s, the quintessential sitcom, maybe I'm wrong, but I think more people actually lean towards the honeymooners than I Love Lucy. So if you can, give your opinions on both of the strengths mm -hmm. and weaknesses of these two titans. Well, I think, I think that for Lucy and... People do love Lucy. Even today, it's still a very popular show. I will say at the outset, I'm not the world's biggest Lucy fan because the the screwball redhead 
uh, Ricky wah, type of humor doesn't particularly appeal to me. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with it. I personally find it a little bit dated. But the dynamic between Lucy and Desi, real-life husband and wife, at least at the time of the show, founders of Desi Lu Studios, you mentioned technical innovations. It's a, it's a great sitcom premise. You have um, Desi as a successful Cuban-American band leader, so he's got a gig. He's always looking for more, more exposure. Lucy is the somewhat scatterbrained housewife who actually has some common sense, but she's always wanting to be part of what's going on with Desi. She's off on adventures with her friend Ethel, but she's also wanting to be portrayed, wanting to be part of uh, Desi's act. Then you get uh, little Ricky, who's born, who's on the cover of the first TV guide. Huge event, huge event. Um, one of the, probably the first great television event, very special episode, when little Ricky gets born. And so uh, it, it is really, um, really interesting to see how that show explodes on the scene and becomes so popular. Honey, the Honeymooners, I find interesting in a different way. Um, it's very blue collar, very American in a way. And I, I use that term deliberately because the Honeymooners was one of the shows that, um, that the that the American government, you know, USIA, Voice of America, they like to point to a show like The Honeymooners as proof that even the blue collar class in America had hopes for success. They could live in their own apartment. They could own their own television. They had the opportunities to make it big. And of course, Gleason's character, Ralph Cramden, is always trying to find the next big deal. And so, as a, as a piece of, of subtle, quiet propaganda, The Honeymooners is, uh, is very important as it's exported over into Europe. It becomes one of the prime pieces of evidence that the U.S. can point to in contrast to the Soviet Union, to communism. They can say, here, you, you can be a blue-collar bus driver living on one salary, you can own your own car, you can have your own apartment, you can own a television, you can have the hopes of getting other things. This is what capitalism has to offer. Now, on purely an entertainment level, there are, there are going to be people again who point at Ralph Cramden's character, very loud, very brash, always threatening to send his wife Alice to the moon. And uh, they're going to say, well, look, this is the patriarchy. This is the way that men used to... Uh, uh, suppress women. This is all threats of violence and all this kind of stuff. And I, I, I think that really, that really misses the point, um, because uh, he, you know he never, he never hit her for one thing. That, that, that sounds very trite to say, and I apologize for the way I even made that sound. But the point is that for all of his bluster, his wife, who was smarter than he was, who had his number, who could see through most of his gimmicks, Alice knew that he wasn't anything more than, than blustery and that his bark was worse than his bite. And she knew that he loved him. He knew that she loved, she knew that he loved her. He knew that she loved him. And, uh, it's actually a very good, good marriage. So I, I think that I'll acknowledge that there are people who, for whom that isn't going to be their kind of comedy. But I think that the, both the honeymooners and I love Lucy, emphasizes American dream, because Desi is a Cuban-American, you can make it in this country. Ralph's a bus driver, you can make it in this country. So American dream, built around a family, colorful characters, great mass appeal. Two different shows, but both pointed in the same direction. I think, for me, uh, my takes on them are, are this. With Lucille Ball, uh, I can understand why the show is popular then, and I remember growing up, up and 
my earliest memories are the second Lucy show from the late sixties, where she's mm-hmm. a, a, a widow, I think, uh, and she has yes. she has Candy Moore the do- not can was it can yeah Candy Moore the daughter, and then her, her last show with her two own kids, and I actually preferred the comic timing of the later Lucy, which we'll get to in the sixties and seventies, and I think I think there was some missed opportunities if that. Lucille Ball could have been a female Archie Bunker type. Yeah. She seemed to be more in that way. Now, with, with Gleason, uh, I remember, and I, we, I think we briefly spoke about it uh, in the 40s show, about his 1949 turn as Chester Riley coming over from radio right. and how that really didn't do well. And no. then William Bendix, a few years later, made a, a, a fairly modest hit of that same character. Um, but I think it's because the life of Riley was as... For me, generic a, a show as can be. The the Bendix sh- stuff. Bendix was a good, solid comic actor. Nothing against him, but there wasn't anything different. For me, what separates the honeymoon is the canonical thirty nine for the one season, as well as some of the best episodes in the assorted uh, incarnations before and after, is that America may have loved Lucy, but America was Ralph Cramden. Yes. You could get in his shoes much more easily. You know, then you could. I mean, as far as I recall, there aren't any episodes in the canonical 39 where Ralph is on the edge of a bi- ledge of a building doing something crazy, waiting for George Reeves to show up. He was. <laughs> it was the same kind of. It was the same kind of thing. Oh, I heard someone has a stock tip. Oh, the guy down the street, you know, uh, is going to enter me in some tournament. It, it, it's the same kind of thing, and I would say it's almost subversive, though. Uh, if you're talking about it as propaganda, because Ralph shows that 99.9% of Americans never make it through capitalism. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a I think that's a really interesting point, and I think that uh, uh, you know it's I I think that uh, you're you're at, you're absolutely right on, particularly with the idea of uh, Ralph is the everyman. Um, that is America, and I think that uh, Gleason had a way of being able to connect with people. And of course, Art Carney is such an important part of the success of the Honeymooners. Ed Norton, um, Carney is brilliant. Without Carney, there is no Honeymooners. You could even argue that there is no no Gleason as we know him without Carney. Carney is one of the first really great second bananas on television and um, Gleason always recognized that, always knew that Carney was was the secret to the success of Ralph uh, being able to to um, ground him in some ways, being able to bounce off him. Uh, Ralph is a great straight man in the scenes with uh, with uh, Norton. And and what could be more earthy than working in the sewers of New York? You know, that's uh, that, the uh, the these guys had real jobs too, and I think that's something that you uh, take for granted nowadays. But in an age where sitcom stars figures didn't necessarily they weren't defined by their jobs I mean, for example what did Ozzie Nelson do you know, you know we know that in real life Ozzie was a band leader before he became a TV mogul but that's never really defined he's just around what did um, Robert Young's character do in uh, in in uh, uh, father knows best. What did um, the what did uh, Beaver's dad yeah. do? Well, they were in some kind of business, you know, insurance, something, white collar workers. But um, Ralph, I think Ralph and Ed are are some of the first sitcom characters that you can really identify with as being American workers. Yeah. So looking at 1952. The top three shows are on CBS. CBS seems to be rising. And then the mm-hmm. bottom, the last seven are NBC. ABC is nowhere to be found. You have Lucy, the two Arthur Godfreys. Number four, the highest NBC show, Dragnet. So this is the first cop show that makes an appearance. We have Texaco Star, Buick Circus Hour, Colgate Comedy Hour, Gangbusters. I don't know what that was. Is, is, 
Yeah, well, um, Gangbusters was kind of a, a companion piece with Dragnet. They'd uh, okay. both been successful on radio, and they the first year they actually alternated in the same time slot because they couldn't make enough Dragnet episodes quickly enough to stay on. So Gangbusters was a big hit, but it was never intended to be on every week for a long period of time. It really just held the time slot until they could do Dragnet every week. So we're still seeing the variety format uh, holding mm -hmm. the sort of hegemony, even though I Love Lucy is number one. Um, what were some of the early 50s shows that sort of flew under the radar, though? I mean, we know, you know, like I said, The Honeymooners was not a big hit in its one season. Mm -hmm. um, when we think back about uh, Father Knows Best or Leave it to Beaver or uh, some of the other sitcoms that when I grew up, Burns and Allen, The Abbott and Costello yeah. Show... Um, these shows were never big ratings hits, but in some ways, Seinfeld always said he ripped off the Abbott and Costello show, basically. So obviously it had, I guess, a greater impact than, you know, uh, some of the other more well-known shows. What, what, what are some of these under-the-radar shows from the early 50s especially? Well, it, interestingly enough, um, mentioning Leave it to Beaver... In the 50s, that would have been seen as a slightly under-the-radar show. Beaver was always popular, but it was never a big hit. Um, Father Knows Best among the family sitcoms was the hit in, in the 50s. Leave it to Beaver was not. That was a show that began to thrive when it went into syndication, when it was shown in reruns uh, after school and into the 70s, and particularly by the time it gets on Nick at Night, um, that's when Beaver became such a quintessential show of the era. But Beaver would have been one of those shows that kind of flew under the radar at the time. Um, I think that... Uh, if you're looking particularly in uh, the late uh, or in the early 50s, you, a show that a lot of people don't remember anymore is Craft Television Theater. That was a, uh, another dramatic anthology. It was very successful. When it uh, went off the air, it was, at the time, the longest running show in the history of television, and it was the last primetime program to debut in the 40s to go off the air. Mm. And it was so successful, in fact, that at one time it was on twice a week on two different networks. Kraft actually bought time on both NBC and ABC, and one night they'd show a Kraft television theater on NBC, which was the more popular of the two, but the next night they'd have a completely different story on ABC, so it's an interesting situation, but it's the um, it is uh, shows you how how strong that show was, and and another um, another show of that type from that era, I think, is um, Robert Montgomery Presents. Um, it's another anthology show. It's important for a couple of reasons, I think, besides the fact that Robert Montgomery is Elizabeth Montgomery's father. Mm -hmm. And that's probably what a lot of people today, if they knew him, would recognize him as being her dad. But Robert Montgomery was a, a, a big star in the movies. He wasn't an A-lister, I don't think. I might put him as a, a high B, but he was certainly a recognizable figure. Did a lot of very good movies in a, in a back in a day when movie stars acted in a lot of things. He produced um, Robert Montgomery Presents, one of the first examples of a Hollywood star who really takes an active involvement in his television show. He produces it. He occasionally appears in it, but not every week. He does introduce it, but he isn't in most of the plays. He builds up a repertory cast of actors, including his daughter, to do the summer run of the show. He becomes a media advisor to President Eisenhower, which means that we're seeing in the mid-50s the beginning of politicians understanding how important television is going to be. They knew it was there, but, but Eisenhower, who was no fool, knew that he had to develop a persona, a, a way of communication on television. Who better to advise him on that than somebody like Robert Montgomery? So he became a White House advisor. I think that's an interesting show to take a look at. Um, um, 
Go ahead, I'm sorry. Just, just before we get too far from it, mm -hmm. uh, when you mentioned craft theater, initially you said the second episode, or the second version of it was on CBS, and then you said or ABC. Which ABC. one was it? I mean it was, a ABC, I'm it was, sorry. It was uh, NBC and ABC. Okay. So uh, let me just, uh, let's just go through the years and, and see some trends before we pick up on some other stuff. In 53, I Love Lucy's Holding on Top, Dragnet goes to number two. Then we got Arthur Godfrey, You Bet Your Life. Milton Burrow makes a comeback at number five. Arthur Godfrey again, Ford Theater, Jackie Gleason's first appearance at num number eight, and then Fireside and Colgate Comedy Hour. So it seems that things were holding pretty steady. Uh, and let's see, we got... Oh, uh, speak of the devil. In 1954, I Love Lucy's number one, Jackie Gleason's number two. Then we got Dragnet, You Bet Your Life, Toast of the Town, Disneyland. Okay, so I grew up on that. That's this is this is the equivalent, I guess, of a, a children's uh, uh, variety show. Jack Benny, George Goebel. I had no idea George Goebel was ever a top ten performer. Mm -hmm. Ford Theater and December Bride. So let's talk about some of these new ones that uh, we mentioned. Disneyland. I remember as a kid, you know, this was, uh, I guess this was right after Disneyland must have been built in the 1950s. Well, it, yeah, it's, it, this is a game changer because Walt Disney becomes the first studio executive. And it's, it's interesting because you have the Disney brand and it's very easy to overlook the fact that Walt Disney was actually a, per, a real person. You know, it's one of those things that, that tends to get overlooked. But Disney was an extreme shrewd businessman and studio mogul and he was the first of the major studio heads to make a deal with television to to put to put original programming from the studio on TV and the deal he entered with with ABC was that a ABC was desperate for programming. I think we may have covered this in a previous show, but ABC was the television network that did not have a base of affiliates that, from radio. They'd been part, I think they were part of the, the, you know, they were spun off when NBC's radio had the blue network and the red network. But ABC was struggling for life on a regular basis and Disney goes to the network and says if you fund the construction of this amusement park that I'm building if you contribute to the construction of Disneyland I will produce shows for your network and so ABC um, was was uh, a big player in the funding of the construction of Disneyland and in return uh, Disney is giving them shows like uh, Davy Crockett, uh, adventure shows. He's bringing in the, some of the cartoons that are classics that now can actually be seen on TV. He's got his award-winning nature shows that, uh, that he's doing. He's um, really giving the network some serious credibility and some seriously good programming. I think people... people um, look at, at um, Davy Crockett, you've got Fess Parker uh, uh, starring in that before he becomes Daniel Boone. You've got Buddy Ebsen as his sidekick. You have some other American history dramas that are being made about Francis Mary and the Swamp Fox. Um, and I think that, uh, that that's a real shot in the arm for ABC. Of course, Disney then goes on to uh, put out the Mickey Mouse Club, which is on Monday through Friday afternoons on the network. So that becomes your post-school programming for kids who are coming home from school. Annette Funicello, um, uh, some again, some very recognizable content. And that, that, I think, when you're talking about a kid's variety show or children's programming, Mickey Mouse Club is clearly children's programming. Disneyland is, is pretty much what you came to expect when you saw Disney finally move over to NBC and introduce the wonderful world of color. It's an anthology show of sorts in that it's always going to be showing a different Disney production. But once Disney comes into the picture, then you'll see Warner Brothers, then you'll see 20th Century Fox. You'll see more active, direct studio involvement where they're looking to become a part of television rather than viewing television constantly as a competitor so 
George Gobel, growing up mm -hmm. in the late 60s through the 70s, I knew him basically uh, as guest starring on some variety shows. Uh, he'd show up, uh, you know, I guess on the Match Game or Hollywood Squares, that kind of thing. Carson what, show yeah. a lot. What, yeah. what, was, what was his show? Was it a variety show? Or was yeah, it, a... it, was, it was a variety show. And uh, the highlight was, was Goebel, who would have his monologue, who would act in some skits, as well as introducing a guest who might be involved in some of the sketches. But uh, Goebel is, is an amazing one, one and a half year phenomenon. That first year, he just takes people by storm. And... Uh, Oh, well, I'll be a dirty bird, you know, some, uh, and talking about spooky old Alice, his wife, and, and, and he has all these catchphrases that people catch on to, and Goebel is big stuff, and by the end of the second season, it's running out of steam, you know, he's alternate, I think he was alternating with Eddie Fisher every other week, but, but Goebel... I don't want to call him a one-year wonder because he obviously had a lot of staying power, but that first year is almost inexplicable as to how big a hit that becomes and how big a star he becomes, and it, it doesn't last, but it's great while it does. So. And finally, number ten was December Bride. Never heard of it. What was that? Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a standard sitcom. I think that. Uh, I have never seen an episode of it myself, although I'm, I'm aware of it from seeing its listings and reading about it. But um, there's nothing, well, for all of you December Bride fans out there, I don't mean this to be insulting. I wouldn't consider it an, a special show of any kind. So since we mentioned the Mickey Mouse Club, let's take a little detour and talk about other kids' shows. Probably the two most famous that come to my mind uh, would be uh, Howdy Doody, and mm -hmm. then uh, Captain Kangaroo debuted too. Um, mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about those two particularly, maybe, and then the whole genre? Of sure. Shows? Well, there, there again, you have um, two shows that are poles apart. Captain Kangaroo is a gentle, sedate show. It's an early version, perhaps, of Mister Rogers' Neighborhood. Although I don't think the captain is even as laid back as Fred Rogers was but uh, Bob Keeshan had been on Howdy Doody he played Clarabelle the Clown who never had any lines uh, he was not always Clarabelle he left the show before Doody went off in 1960 but uh, he came over to CBS he has a show that is mostly gentle amusement educational he's got guests on going over different things he introduces a lot of children to the world of children's literature he reads stories on the air so you have a lot of Newbery award-winning shows that are on uh, uh, Newbery award-winning books I'm sorry that that he reads on there um, there are cartoons like uh, Tom Terrific and Lariat Sam, uh, Terry Toons cartoons. And so it is, um, it, 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 it's a show that adults have extremely fond memories of from their time watching it. And again, it, it, uh, I, I use the word gentle, and I think that is particularly in contrast to Howdy Doody which uh, is really Milton Berle for kids. Sugar-driven, screaming peanut gallery full of uh, the, the kids in the, the live studio audience. The, the puppet, Howdy Doody, and his human that he talks to, Buffalo Bob Smith, and Clarabelle the Clown, who doesn't talk, who just has a horn that he squeaks on. But the show is, is anarchy, five days a week. If you want to imagine filling a, uh, uh, filling a small child with sugar-frosted bomb pops and throw some caffeine in there uh, as well, then you're getting a pretty good idea of what Howdy Doody is like. Um, I think I think Calvin. If it, for people who remember Calvin and Hobbes, Calvin would have been a perfect participant on Howdy Doody. However, you should also you should also keep in mind when you're talking about Howdy Doody that Howdy 
has a lot of cultural impact at the same time. He runs for president in the late 1950s, starts a howdy duty for president campaign. And um, the, the impact of that and the number of kids who join in, who send in, who get involved in this kind of stuff shows just what a range of um, audience howdy duty had. Uh, that's a five day a week show, just like a Captain Kangaroo, which is in the morning, captures the kids before they go to school or the preschool kids. Howdy Doody's on in the afternoon after school. Um, Howdy Doody eventually goes to Saturday mornings. Uh, Captain Kangaroo stays on the air until I think the 80s when it finally goes off. But you've got you've got other as you pointed out other uh, kids shows as well and um, a lot of these are, are, are interesting because they are genre shows you have science fiction and westerns now we when we talk about westerns in the era we're generally talking about Roy Rogers and Hopalong Cassidy and those are shows with great adventure appeal to children um, I don't know that you would actually label them children's shows, but uh, Roy Rogers has a huge fan club. Millions of kids belong to it, as does, um, as, uh, and, and I think that when we talk about the evolution of Westerns into the adult Western, which begins with Wyatt Earp late in the 50s, what you're really talking about is seeing the transition from uh, Hopalong Cassidy, from Roy Rogers, from, and I know I'm missing somebody there. Gunsmoke? Yeah, not Gunsmoke. Gunsmoke is an adult Western. That mm -hmm. would, would never have fallen into the same category as the kids' Westerns, but uh, I think that what, uh, what you're seeing is that as a children's show because it had always existed with different in in the movies in serials things like that same thing about science fiction the early science fiction shows um rocky jones Captain Video. uh tom corbett Captain those Video. yep the you know uh those are are geared toward kids they're really just uh cowboy shows in space and um, there, I, you know, I saw the entire run of Rocky Jones last year. Um, it's actually a very good show. I mean, you can tell that it's written for kids. Uh, nobody ever gets killed. Um, the violence is is physical, but you don't you don't have gunshots or anything like that. But it presents, in its own way, it presents a much more nuanced view of space travel than a lot of other shows of that period. But uh, those shows, those shows. Those two types of genres specifically are the kind that really have kid appeal. The rest of the kids' programming, I think, if you're talking about them as a uh, as, as a whole, tend to be ones on the local level, where children's shows are huge local commodity. You usually have someone from the station, the weatherman is always a popular person. The guy who gives the weather doubles as Captain Eleven or Commodore Cappy or Grandpa Ken or something like that. And they host these afternoon or morning shows. They show cartoons. They have live audiences. There's a lot of commercial tie-in to different sponsors locally. Um, but those are the ones that really dominate the television scene in the, in, the, in the children's variety era. And again, those are shows that have remarkably stuck with people over the years. Um, you, you'll have um, adults still talking about the shows they saw in the 50s and 60s with tremendous warmth and affection. It was a vital part of their growing up. And wh whether the shows were, were anarchy or not, they, the Bozo the Clown show, which started out, uh, I think, in Chicago, and a lot of these, these other shows, every network, I mean, every market, Every market has its own 
iconic children's host or two or three. In Minneapolis, where I was growing up, you had Axel and his dog. You had Clancy and uh, Clancy the cop and Willie Ketchum. You had Grandpa Ken. You had Dave and Pete. You had all these different characters that were on television. And kids grew up to know and love them. And they loved the men who played them and the women who played these characters, Carmen the nurse. And so... That was such an important part of kids' lives growing up. It's one of the specific eras of areas of television, one of the specific genres that has no comparable equivalent today. You have you have shows like Sesame Street, but Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood is no longer in first run, the electric company, shows like that. You have nothing on the local level. And it's heartbreaking, really, because that was such a vital part of, uh, of a child's life growing up. And I'm sorry to see that that's, that's ended. Uh, I want to talk, since we talked about sci-fi and westerns, uh, The Lone Ranger and, and Superman, that's another one, in a yeah. sense, were basically... Lone Ranger is, I guess, as an early version of a superhero kind of, he's sort of the mm-hmm. Batman of the Old West. Um, uh, now, both of those also, I think, were syndicated. A Lone Ranger may have started out on a network, but I think it then did, yeah. it became syndicated. Uh, so th- talk about those, because I think Superman was syndicated from day yep. one. We have mentioned syndication early in the 40s, uh, but... Superman had to have been one of the earliest, you know, really successful. As I said, he appeared on I Love Lucy as a syndicated yeah. character. Mm-hmm. Well, that syndication really hits its stride in the 50s because you have a lot of TV stations out there, and not all of them have network affiliations. They need programming. Not all of the network programming is, uh, is, is successful, and not all of the time slots are filled. So there is a need for programming independent from what the networks have. So you begin to see the evolution of syndicated programming, shows that are made specifically to be marketed to uh, on a station-by-station basis. Um, one of the most successful independent uh, production companies of the time, I think, was Ziv, Z-I-V. Uh, They did Sea Hunt with Lloyd Bridges. They did Highway Patrol with Academy Award winner Broderick Crawford. They did shows like Science Fiction Theater, which which are fondly remembered by people. You had adventure shows like Whirly Birds and Ripcord that were out there. You had actors like Rod Cameron who had been so successful with the idea of syndication that they only did syndicated programs. They got a a bigger cut of the proceeds, particularly if they had any kind of an investment in the show. So somebody like Rod Cameron knows he's going to be um, financially better off doing syndication. He he does a series of one-year shows where he's playing different characters. They're very successful. He becomes very, very wealthy as a result of them. So you've got this great boom in syndicated shows that will appear in prime time. They'll appear on Saturdays. The, on, and, and Sundays in the afternoon. And uh, as you say, uh, something like uh, Roy Rogers, Gene Autry, The Lone Ranger, those become very successful as well. And then the success of I Love Lucy being filmed comes back into another type of syndication when you start syndicating previous network shows to be rerun in syndication on these network on these stations and you'll see the ads that some of the syndicators put out for uh, investing in these shows you know you you loved uh, you 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 loved Danny Thomas in make room for daddy now make room for Danny Thomas on your schedule that kind of uh, advertising so you've got this secondary market where you have shows that go into syndication to be rerun that wasn't possible when they were live but it is possible when they're on film and uh, Lucy and Desilu show just how successful you can become by recycling your programs for future viewing so let's talk a little bit about cartoons at this point we you know disney has a top 10 hit here by the middle of the 50s 
But that also paves the way for uh, the Hanna Barbera shows from mm -hmm. the late '50s through, I guess, maybe through the end of the, this century. Uh, the cheaper animation, uh, earlier stuff. The Flintstones come on in the '60s. Uh, then there's a Warner Brothers, the direct competitor to Disney, and a lot of the Looney Tunes uh, are repackaged, just like the Little Rascals mm -hmm. live television. The Little Rascals, in fact, weren't in the movies. It was our gang. They became the Little Rascals when they moved on to TV. TV. Yeah. The Three Stooges became much bigger once they got their their uh, you know. Uh, yeah, they were shorts. they were all but all but forgotten until they came back on television, and, and then the huge stars. And then and then we get some. Really, at the end, we start getting what I think is still one of the best uh, uh, cartoons ever, and that's the Rocky and Bullwinkle show, which is mm -hmm. you know, um, which is an anthology uh, kind of format. In there, so if you could talk a little bit about uh, cartoon and animation in the fifties. Yeah, you had two. You had two or three different schools of animation. You had the old style animation, the very lavish animation that you would see on. Warner Brothers, and um, in fact, the Bugs Bunny show started out in prime time, so that that winds up a staple of Saturdays. But it, when it is introduced to the networks, it's a prime time show, and uh, Bugs Bunny is one of Warner Brothers' biggest stars. Um, then you have you have the made for TV type of animation. Uh, an example of that would be Felix the Cat and Popeye. They had both had long successful runs as movie characters. Felix the Cat is is inextricably intertwined with the history of TV since he was the first character shown on television in the United States because of his, uh, statue of Felix the Cat because of his black and white color. It was easy to um, tune things, but but Felix is a big star in the movies seen as Charlie Chaplin-esque, but he comes to television in a series of 15-minute cartoons. Same thing with Popeye, King Features Syndicate, again another syndication run. So you had those kinds of um, Casper of the cartoons. Friendly Ghost uh, yep. and, and all yep. that. Yep, uh, Wendy Little the Lulu. Little Lulu. Mm -hmm. Yep, you had you had Harvey's uh, yeah. Harvey Tunes, yeah. and uh, that again, that another prime time show before it moved to uh, to uh, Sunday mornings. I think they were often seen when I was growing up. Then you had Mr. Magoo, another uh, one who had gone from the theaters to television and prime time. Then you had what I would call the third kind of animation, and that's one where I kind of put the quotes around it. It's something like. Um, Diver Dan or Clutch Cargo. Yeah, with the mouth. Yes, where they superimpose the talking mouth. <laughs> um, and today they're very campy, but I can imagine what they must have been thinking at the time. Look, we can actually make these animated characters talk, and they're talking just the way real people do. <laughs> but uh, but you know you know one of the funny things about. Anime, animated shows is that they didn't really take hold in the Saturday morning time slots that we think of until the very late 50s, early 60s, really in the, into the 60s before they took hold. Before that, you had in the late 50s, the average Saturday morning lineup would consist of mostly Western films, Western shorts. Um, you would have some sci-fi things. You would have uh, local programming, and you would have um, comedies. But there, aside from a show like Howdy Doody, which by that time had transitioned to Saturday mornings, or Captain Kangaroo, which had a Saturday edition in addition to Mondays through Fridays, Live action television was mostly what you saw on Saturday mornings. It isn't until you get into the 60s that the cartoon takes an entrenched place on Saturday mornings to the point where the Saturday morning kids lineup becomes a major show that you roll out in prime time with previews of all your Saturday morning stars and you have varying degrees of, of animation uh, quality there but uh, other than that you know, Huckleberry Hound, Yogi Bear those Han Hanna-Barbera shows that you were talking about that premiered in syndication you look in the old TV guides most of them are early evening shows they're not Saturday morning at that point um, 
you had mentioned briefly about uh, morning shows like the Today Show and then evening shows like the Tonight Show and all the competitors there. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted to talk about a different kind of show that's often overlooked. Um, uh, and that would be sort of genre movies that are compiled into local television shows. Most famously, Vampira from uh, mm -hmm. L.A., who later appeared in Plan 9 from Outer Space, uh, one of the worst movies of all time, but still <laughs> funny. But when, no, I was, no. when I was growing up in the New York area, uh, there was Creature Feature, which featured monster movies, Chiller Theater, which would have monsters and other horror, you know, kind of stuff. And then there was the Million Dollar Movie, which would be, you know, classic movies from the 30s and 40s. You, you could see The Dead End Kids or you could see Joan Crawford or, or whatever. Uh, and from what I know, these, every every major market had a creature feature, a chiller theater, and a million dollar movie mm -hmm. or some slight variant of them. Yeah, can you talk about them and the hosts like a vampire? Yeah, you, the, you're, you're absolutely right. And that's kind of, kind of goes hand in hand with the local kids shows. Local television had a real presence back in the day, and you had a lot of stars on local television. In the case of the kids' shows, they were people who had other jobs at the studio, like the weatherman, sportscaster. In the case of the movies, um, that might have been the case. You'll, you'll remember, just as a side digression, if you're a fan of SCTV, you'll remember Count Floyd's Monster Chiller Horror Theater. Well, you'll also remember that Floyd, the character, is also the anchorman on the SCTV uh, Evening News. So that's... Uh, uh, an absurd example, but an example nonetheless of how you did double duty on mm. television in the 50s. But all of these markets, everybody had a late night movie host. And you're right, they were usually chiller features, monster movies. You had some of the great monster features coming over that were finally getting television exposure after having been played in the theaters. And these personalities were, I suppose you could say the most similar thing you might have today would be somebody like Sven Gulli. Mm -hmm. They weren't like Mystery Science Theater, where they would actually comment on the movies while the yeah. movies were on. They'd appear in the breaks between movies, they would set the tone, they would maybe have a contest, maybe have some humorous comments, but they became big stars in their own right, Vampira, big star of, of the era in Los Angeles. And so those became a staple of programming in local stations across the country. There were very few stations that would actually show a movie like Plan 9 that didn't have a host. And um, you, you start to look at, move, at uh, markets like New York, or San Francisco. In New York, I'm thinking you've got the late show and the late, late show. And in uh, San Francisco, you've got the all-night movies that I've noticed in some of my TV guides. And so you begin to see this phenomenon of, of local stations broadcasting 24 hours. And the overnight programming is, for the most part, going to be movies. Those movies, for the most part, are going to be double or triple features that are unified under a single umbrella where you have a host and between segments uh the between movie segments they might be interviewing celebrities especially out in california they might be doing their shtick they uh they could be running a contest uh if you look at the same phenomenon in the matinee movie they're playing dialing for dollars give me you know give us the count and the amount um Dialing for dollars especially comes in in the 60s, but um, for anybody who's never experienced dialing for dollars, that's pretty much what you're talking about. You have a count, uh, which you get by spinning a wheel, so it might be up five, down three, and you'll have an amount of money that's in the jackpot. It increases every day when what you do is use the phone book or in some cases cards from people who have sent in that they want to be called so you pull a card out you've got somebody's phone number you give them a call this is uh 
you know, this is John Smith for dialing for dollars. Can you give us the count and the amount? And you might say, well, it's up five, $325. You're right. You win the $325. You're wrong. The jackpot will go up to 350 or something the next day. But this is another example, I think, of your movie hosts, these matinee hosts who combine a game with a movie or combine celebrity interviews with a movie. In Minneapolis, again, our matinee host was Mel Jazz, who was an entertainment personality in the sense that, that he would cover movie openings. He was very smart in scheduling movies. He had a lot to do with the selection of the movies that he would show, which is why on occasion you would see an Oscar-winning foreign film like... Uh, uh, the investigation of a citizen above suspicion wind up as a matinee movie in the mid-70s on TV. But you have um, these hosts who are personalities in their own right. And it's, it's a wonderful part of local television. And again, I think it's so sad that you don't have that local television presence anymore. So that's a nice segue into the 1955 uh, Top Ten because... Here we have at number one, the $64,000 question. <laughs> ah, yes. And it's the beginning of the quiz show era, uh, which dominated for a handful of years. Then you have Lucy Sullivan, Disney, uh, Jack Benny, December Bride, Groucho. You can consider that quasi-game show. Yeah. But, uh, the you game bet is like Dragnet, Charlotte. The Millionaire, which is about a, a rich guy who gives his money away to people in need. And then I've Got a Secret at number 10. So uh, I, let's talk about the quiz show scandal. Um uh, because we, we, you mentioned how uh, by this time wrestling was waning, but in, in a sense we got, instead of fixed athletic events, we got fixed intellectual events. Yeah, yeah you've, got, you've got three dominant genres at this point in time on television. You have police shows, you have westerns up the wazoo, and you have quiz shows. And the quiz shows are big money quiz shows too, $64,000 question. You, and that actually becomes one of the cheaper ones at one point where you have all of this money uh, in play. And you have characters on the quiz shows who are becoming celebrities because of their appearances on the show week after week. Now the, the quiz shows are brilliantly constructed because you have some concepts that are just tailor-made for good television. You have the isolation booth, where the contestant is sitting in the booth while his opponent is asked the question. You're in the isolation booth, so you don't hear the question. Uh, when that person, when your opponent answers, then they turn everything off in his booth, and you're now the one in the spotlight, and you have to try to answer the same question without knowing whether or not your opponent successfully answered it. And the camera closes in. You see the sweat on people's faces. You see it. You see it pouring down. You see them struggling with the answer to the question, and they're really thinking it over. And you see these impossibly dif difficult questions from, from who appeared in bit parts in movies to who the referee was in a certain title fight to chemical formulas, all these kinds of things that people were experts on in their various various fields that they had chosen to concentrate on. You have suspenseful music. And best of all, if they get the question right, or in the case of a quiz show called 21, if there's a tie, they return the next week. So you get to build up suspense week after week after week. The only comparable thing I can think of in the quiz show uh, of the of quiz shows of today would have been Who Wants to Be a Millionaire when it originally started. And you had that suspense as they climbed up the ladder toward the million dollar question. But whereas uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire aired in consecutive nights. These shows would air once a week. And so they could build up tremendous viewer ratings. Now we have a problem with that. And the problem is called a dull contestant. And the problem is called ratings. And the problem is called the sponsor who wants bigger ratings for the show. And at this point, sponsors are still driving 
a lot of network programming. They buy the time, and they produce the show that goes into that time slot. So they're controlling what they see, and they have a vested outcome in the result. Um, what The most famous quiz show participants were, would wind up on the cover of Time magazine. They would get their own opportunities on television. They really had a wonderful chance to make not only money, but to be able to parlay that into um, success. I'm going to give you two examples. One of them is uh, Dr. Joyce Brothers, whose specialty was boxing. And she said later on that she chose boxing because as a young, attractive woman, the best way to get on television was to have an unusual topic. So she chose boxing. She went on, a, on one of the shows, and, and they threw every possible question they could at her to try to get her off. But she knew them all. She, was, she won the, the jackpot, was able to um, finance her education, and parlayed all that into being Dr. Joyce Brothers. Uh, star of uh, television shows. She was an honest participant in the, in the quiz shows. Now we're going to talk about somebody who is not. His name was Charles Van Doren. And Van Doren was on 21 in the late 50s. Van Doren was young. He was charismatic, very intelligent, very good looking. He was from a prominent family. The Van Dorns were prominent in literature and academia. His father was a poet. I think he had an uncle who'd won the Pulitzer Prize. He himself was a uh, was uh, an associate professor at Columbia. And Van Doren went on this streak week after week, appearing on 21, winning, answering questions, Time Magazine. He became a huge star, and he wound up becoming a full professor at Columbia. He wound up being a co-host of the Today Show. He had opportunity, he wrote books, he collaborated on others, he was being consulted for various network programs, and then it turned out that he was part of the scandal. The scandal evolved slowly, but what it amounted to was that these shows were being scripted not every person was guilty. As I say, Joyce Brothers was one who wasn't. But they were scripted shows. They were, given, they were either given the correct answers to ensure that they would keep appearing week after week, or they were being given answers in fields where the producers had the reasonable expectation of, of knowing that they would have the answers. Uh, if I was appearing on one of them, for example, they might have decided they were going to give me questions about television history because they had a pretty good idea I'd know the answer. So they, they wouldn't outright give them the answers, but they would say, we're going to be asking you questions about this area. But in other cases, they were outright giving them the answers to the shows. And that was the case, I think, with Van Dorn. He knew the answers. Well... The queer show scandal erupted when a contestant on a daytime show called Dotto, might have been the primetime version, but Dotto was on both daytime and primetime, so, ran upon the notes that her opponent had had that included the answers to some of the questions that had been on the show. Goes to the district attorney, uh, goes to Congress. This thing starts to snowball. You have fraud is what the federal government called it. You were fraudulently deceiving the public into thinking that the show they were seeing was live and unrehearsed and that the answers were spontaneous when, in fact, it was all just a sham. The, uh, the, the whole thing had been predetermined. Everybody knew what the answers were, and the show was a lie. Uh, what a shock. Um, and, and we look at that nowadays and we think that how could people be so gullible but they were gullible back then television had been sold as a medium that was going to revolutionize entertainment 
that was going to bring education into the home, that was a technological marvel that would open a new era. Yes, perhaps we were naive for believing that everything would be on the up and up, but people had been given every reason to put their trust and confidence in this, this new medium. And now to find that the utopian new age that was supposed to come after the end of World War II, to find out that this was a hoax, that we had been played for suckers, and that all of this stuff that we had seen on television that was supposed to be spontaneous and high drama, that all of that was a sham, was tremendously discouraging and and popping all these these bubbles of the people had at the time now again you could say that we were naive to believe in all of it but this was an era where that kind of thing was important and where it was easy to believe in these shows and to find out that they the shows were fraudulent well uh, some of the producers wound up being banned from television. Some of them wound up being blackballed. Uh, Van Dorn himself lost his professorship at Columbia, lost his appearance, uh, his gig on the Today Show, crumbled, and um, lost everything, as a matter of fact. Uh, he went into seclusion for the rest of his life. He wound up being a, a, a successful author and being an editor of books, but frequently without his name being used. He, he, he developed a, a fulfilling career of sorts, um, but not always under his own name. And not until just a few years before his death would he even return to the question of the quiz show scandals and, and discuss it. He was a, a perfect example of a man who took his shame in a way like a man. He, yeah, he was guilty, but he never ex tried to excuse it. He never tried to mount a big comeback from it. He took his lumps went into seclusion, applied his talents as an academic where they wouldn't be particularly noticed, and disappeared from the scene. It, it, it's a, it, in a sense, it's one of the great American tragedies to see what happened with the quiz shows and to see the effect it had on the innocence of America. But for a long time after that, the quiz shows that we would see on television were shows like What's My Line and I've Got a Secret, where you had celebrities involved, the entertainment, the parlor game aspect of the show was what caught on. Um, you had very little money at stake. I mean, the biggest prize you could win on uh, What's My Line was $50, plus expenses for flying you in to sh see the show. But it changed completely the idea of the quiz shows. The big money ones were gone for a long time. The primetime quiz show was gone for a long time. Nowadays we watch um, reality shows like Survivor, and when we find out that aspects of it were scripted, or edited for television, we don't think twice because we've come to expect that kind of thing. That kind of revelation, though, was what killed the quiz shows. I think the only guy who was a quiz show host that had a later career in game shows was Jack Barry with The Joke is Wild, and I think he, it's because he owned a piece of some of the shows yeah. that he was able to financially... He did finally come back, but he took he was blackballed for some time before then. Couldn't get any kind of a job on television. You'll see him in the late 60s, you know, The Joker's Wild, shows like that. He and his partner, uh, Enright, were able to make a comeback, but um, the consequences for a lot of these people... The consequences were harsh. Not to say that they weren't justified, but they were harsh. And what it did do as a lasting um, emblem of the quiz show scandal was it took sponsors out of programming. More and there, there had been a move by networks to get more involved in programming anyway to be able to control the time slots, but you'll remember that most of the involvement in the quiz show scandals had been on the part of the, the um, sponsors. And the networks finally decided once and for all sponsors could not control the content of the time spots. So you had 
you you had a, a sea change where networks were not selling time to a single sponsor for a half an hour. The sponsor was not taking ownership of the show and developing it independent of the producers or the networks. It changed the way the television was uh, programmed. And you you still had some shows, Armstrong Circle Theater, for example, or the U.S. Steel Hour, where you had a close identification with between the sponsor and the program. But you never again would have that kind of relationship where the sponsors themselves produced the shows for the networks. And uh, as you said, only the small money game shows with celebrities really survived until maybe the late 60s when you got <clears throat> more risque fare like the dating game and the newlywed game. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, again, they were not uh, big money things. Uh, before right. we leave the question, uh, the fellow who was sort of the Salieri to Van Doren's Mozart, uh, I think he's played by... Uh, um, in the quiz show, Robert Redford's quiz show, he's played by... Yeah. I forget the guy's name. I'm drawing but, the same blank, but yeah. I know exactly who you're talking yeah. about. Uh, but he, he the, the real guy had mentioned that he was put, basically, when they wanted someone to lose, he was put in a sweat box, basically. Mm. They would yeah. turn on and turn up the heat. And put the hot. I'm just wondering, uh, I don't know if it's ever been mentioned, but was anyone ever sued for endangerment of someone's life if someone died of heat prostration or something like that? Yeah. Not, not that I'm aware of. We weren't quite as litigious back then as we are now, but you're right. They, they would turn off the fans. That was another thing that they would do in the isolation booth. They'd turn off the fans so that uh, you didn't get any air circulation. You were closed in there. You started to sweat. And, and, and you're, you're right, uh, Van Doren's counterpart, and I'm, I'm, I'm like you, drawing a blank as to who played him in the movie and I'm drawing a blank. Tatura, uh, John Her, Her, John Herb Stemple was and the John actor. Tatura, John Tatura. Yes. And um, Stemple was another heartbreaking case in a way because he, um, the, sh the, the question he finally missed in order for Van Dorn to advance as the champion was a question he knew the answer to. And he would he begged with the producers, you, you, you're asking me a question about a movie called Marty. It's one of my favorite movies. I've seen this movie so many times. It's very special to me. He pleaded with them to ask him another question that he uh, could lose with, but they wouldn't do it. And so he had to uh, falsely answer a question incorrectly that he knew. And for him, that was the tragedy of it. But Stemple's Stemple's problem was that he was not as photogenic as Van Dorn. He was not as appealing to people as Van Dorn. And they finally decided Stemple has to lose. Uh, let's turn then from one type of hearing regarding the quiz show to uh, the Army McCarthy hearings. And for someone my age growing up, uh, it was Watergate. A, a little bit younger person would remember the Rand contra affair, uh, a few of the Supreme Court justices' hearings. But uh, the granddaddy of them all was uh, at basically the end of the, the Red Scare, which we, I think, might have briefly talked about in, in the 40s show. So uh, tell me a little bit about the sort of uh, soap opera that was uh, a congressional <laughs> hearing. That's a good description for it, too. Um, the Army McCarthy hearings got their name because the chairman of the uh, subcommittee that was investigate was that was doing conducting the investigation of the House Un-American Activities Committee was chaired by Senator Joseph McCarthy from Wisconsin, and he was the father of what came to be called uh, the Red Scare. He was investigating communist infiltration and influence in the U.S. government and in entertainment. And the Army McCarthy hearings were so called because he was at this point investigating communist infiltration of the United States Army. And it uh, ran for three months in June. It was probably the most successful daily soap opera on TV at that point in time. Um, it was shown live on television on both ABC and Dumont because they needed programming. And they found the hearings a great form of human drama. So they were being aired daily, gavel to gavel on these networks. And we were seeing for the first time uh, 
for any length of time, McCarthy's technique, his tactics, and his investigation of the communist influence. Uh, McCarthy had a chief counsel named Roy Cohn, who uh, was the man who asked a lot of the questions and who provided a lot of the background information. Now, chief counsels for um, congressional hearings are nothing new. They all have them because the congressmen themselves can't possibly accumulate all the information that's being um, provided for the hearings. And, uh, and in fact, Robert F. Kennedy was one of the counsel before the McCarthy hearings, had been involved in it quite closely. Uh, at that stage in his career and in his uh, development, he was quite a rabid anti-communist. But uh, Roy Cohn was a particularly nasty piece of work, and he got a lot of personal information on the people who were being involved in these hearings. And he was McCarthy's attack dog. He was providing uh, a lot of the information that McCarthy was questioning on. And so what happened as the hearings evolved, people began to get a glimpse of McCarthy as somebody who was a bully, who was hounding people, who wouldn't give them a chance to answer, who was picking up on certain things and rephrasing them in extremely incriminating ways and it began to turn the perception of McCarthy with the public around. Up until that time, McCarthy had been very popular. He'd been seen as somebody who was essential in the fight against communism, that he was rooting out communist influence at a time when people were afraid uh, they talked about the idea of the communist under every bed. And so McCarthy had built up quite stature. He was one of the leading Republicans in the country. He was often at loggerheads with people in his own party. And so he was the kind of guy that people look for. He's not owned by anyone. He's out there to find out the truth. And the truth of what people found during the course of these inquiries was that McCarthy was, was bullying and browbeating and came across, now that people could see him, in a very different way than he would have if they had simply read about him in Walter Winchell's columns, for example, or seen him in a uh, clip on the news or in the newsreels. People began to see what they felt was the real McCarthy. And if you're looking at a pivotal day in the history of the Army McCarthy hearings, you're probably looking at June 9th. And McCarthy is um, involved in interviewing a particular Army member who had been accused of being a communist. You had Joseph Welch, who was the um, attorney for this accused person. Uh, I think his name was uh, Fisher. And Welsh is badgering Roy Cohen over the, uh, quite over the badgering that Cohen is doing in the hearings. And McCarthy and Welch have it out. And Welch has this famous saying where he says, Senator McCarthy, have you no shame? Is there nothing you will not do in these hearings? And he says, you know, you're engaging in character assa assassination. Have you no sense of decency, sir? At long last, have you no sense of decency? And what happens with the hearings is um, the torch is picked up by Edward R. Murrow investigating McCarthy on his... Uh, on, on his show, and uh, Murrow devotes the entire half hour of his program to an investigation of McCarthy and showing where McCarthy's investigation has gone off track. McCarthy responds, not particularly well, but um, he responds in a fiery way that in some sense underscores Murrow's own accusations against McCarthy. So at this point in time, we've reached we've reached the crossroads. I, I may have the order of things 
backwards. I mean, it may have been Murrow who started and Welch who finished him off. But the point is that we see the power of television in politics, I think, in three ways. We see McCarthy utilizing the power of television to be able to conduct these hearings on a national stage and to be able to um, show Congress in a way that we would when we have Watergate, when we have Iran-Contra, as they go on farther. These hearings may not have been possible without the Army McCarthy hearings being televised. It shows the power of television there. It also shows the power of television to destroy a career by having McCarthy on television and by having Walsh uh, confronting him live during these hearings, we see that the power that McCarthy had can backfire. You can use television to your own advantage, but you can also have television turn on you. Television is a fickle mistress. And so TV can end a career as easily as it can begin one. Then we have the third part, which is uh, Murrow taking McCarthy on in his show. We see it being the first time, or one of the first times at least, where television becomes an active participant. It's not only showing you what happened, but in the case of Murrow uh, becoming uh, an active participant, we see television taking sides in the form of television being a presenter of news rather than just regurgitating what's gone on, rather than re, re, just rereading the headlines, you have Murrow actually becoming a participant in the news, investigating the news, presenting his investigation, bringing McCarthy down in, uh, in that way. So by the end of the McCarthy, the Army McCarthy hearings, McCarthy's approval rating is now down. He has only got 29% approval. Uh, he has been discredited in the face of many Americans. Um, his, uh, his hearings have been discredited. Eisenhower later takes on McCarthy himself. Um, so between these, between these um, different forces. McCarthy ceases to become a power in American politics. The era of the Red Scare ends. You can say what you like about it. This would be getting off into politics as to whether McCarthy was right or not. But I think a lot of McCarthy, of a lot of McCarthy's defenders would even agree that McCarthy was not, as it turned out, a very good spokesman for their cause. He blows up on television. The, the, the era is over. And we've seen that television is a new and powerful participant in the political realm in many different ways. So we're going to see a different relationship between politics and TV as a result of it. The interesting thing is one of the points that was harped upon in uh, these hearings was was blackmailability uh, of mm -hmm. people, uh, most often through homosexuality, yet... Uh, J. Edgar Hoover, who supplied McCarthy a lot of his information, and Roy Cohn, who is his lawyer, mm -hmm. well-known homosexuals themselves, uh, and, and, and in the closet. Yeah, yeah it, is. It, it And in fact, if you look at the animosity that developed between Robert F. Kennedy and Roy Cohn, Kennedy never had animosity for McCarthy, interestingly enough. McCarthy and Kennedy's father, Joe, were, were friends from a long time back. And the Kennedys always maintained a certain affection with, with Joe McCarthy. But the real antagonism was between RFK and Roy Cohn. And the homosexuality played a big part in it. And the, the uh, Cohen's own homosexuality and his browbeating of other people and his bullying of other staff members, including Kennedy, uh, became a, a real part of that. And it became an important part in Kennedy's later political evolution of his own. So. 1956, to get back to the top 10, we see Lucy on mm -hmm. top, Sullivan, GE Theater, $64,000 question, December Bride, Alfred Hitchcock makes an appearance, I've mm -hmm. Got a Secret, Gunsmoke, uh, which I mentioned, The Perry Como Show, uh, as a throwback to uh, 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 what we were saying 
uh, earlier about uh, SCTV. I remember the parody they did about Mr. Yeah. Relaxation where he's just lying yeah. down and can't Perry do Perry Como is still alive. And then, yeah. and then Jack, and Jack Benny. Now, the interesting thing is here, these shows, the, the, it's an interesting lineup, but uh, you had mentioned uh, that you wanted to talk about the death of the Dumont Network and uh, mm -hmm. Dumont uh, basically, uh, I think it was 56 or 57, they hit the scrap pile. Yeah. So what, what basically caused their downfall? I think, I think if you can reduce it to one thing, the biggest downfall that Dumont had was that there was no network, that su no radio network that supported it. We saw how difficult ABC had in staying alive as a network without that kind of support. What eventually bailed ABC out was a combination of things. Um, most prominently their uh, business deal with Paramount and their business deal with Disney and uh, they, the number of stations that they did have when NBC was forced to divest themselves of one of their radio networks. So ABC was able to hang on, even though they wouldn't be taken seriously as a network for quite a while yet. But Dumont didn't have any of that. Alfred Dumont, who had done so much work on television, who had been such a pioneer in the creation of the technology for television, uh, didn't have any networks. All he had were televisions. And uh, you had the Dumont television, which was a very good television, just as you had the RCA television, which was supporting NBC. But whereas NBC was able to parlay the technology with RCA, with color television, which became a real uh, benchmark of NBC as the days go on, Dumont didn't have any of that. They didn't have the money, so they wound up losing uh, their stars and their shows to other networks. Dumont lost uh, lost Jackie Gleason to CBS. They lost Bishop Fulton Sheen and Life is Worth Living to ABC. They, um, they couldn't hang on to anything. And so at the end, all Dumont had was uh, boxing and wrestling and eventually the last program that I think aired on the Dumont Network was Evening News with Morgan Beatty and uh, Dumont disappears. I think it is... It is unfortunate, but they didn't they didn't have the movie studios as Fox would when they be, finally became the fourth network. They didn't have the radio connections. They didn't have newspapers, which were often investors in initial um, TV stations locally. They had nothing backing it financially, and so Dumont eventually went the way of the wind, not without, you know, a lot of people love Dumont to this day and they look at many of the shows that Dumont created and the stars that they they created but uh, there was nothing behind it so um, looking at uh, 1957 we see a big sea change I Love Lucy had won like four out of the last five seasons and then we see Gunsmoke runs the table mm -hmm. as number one for the next three years and five of the top ten shows in 57 are Wessons we have Gunsmoke, Danny Thomas, as a sitcom comes up, Tales of Wells Fargo, Have Gun, Will Travel, I've Got a Secret, Life and Legend of Wyatt Earp, GE Theater, Restless Gun, I'm presuming a Western, December yep. Bride, and You Bet Your Life. And other than the, the complete sort of hegemony of uh, Westerns rising, I'm surprised to see You Bet Your Life there hanging on. It bounced, it was never a number one show, but Groucho was there. Yeah. And and Spring Byington in December Bride, but <laughs> but your Groucho Groucho is always popular, and by this point in time, as you alluded to earlier, you bet your life isn't really a game show. What it is is an interview show with people appearing on the show in order to be foils for Groucho and for George Fenneman and sidekick, but it's always about Groucho. Um, there's when when uh, when you bet your life finally winds down, it, it's known as Tut to Groucho, and when uh, it goes into syndication, it's the best of Groucho. But it's but it's all about Groucho, and as the Marx Brothers movies continue to be popular on TV, 
Groucho continues to be popular. What I think is the most interesting story in that whole lineup is Gunsmoke at number one. And we had talked about the advent of the adult Western to, to distinguish it from from uh, Gene Autry and Hopalong Cassidy and Roy Rogers. The adult Western took Westerns into a different area. They became a, a synonym of the morality play between good and evil, much more. In, and, and I use that in, different to distinguish it from the kid shows, which always had good and evil. Um, the adult Westerns were about were morality plays. And no show, I think, personified that more than Gunsmoke, because uh, Gunsmoke became what we talked about a little bit when we had uh, Martin Grahams on last yeah. time. Uh, Gunsmoke was a show that became kind of a quasi-anthology series. It, it lasted for so long, 20 seasons, that by the time the show had ended, you had said pretty much everything you could about the main characters, Matt and Doc and Festus before that, Chester and Kitty. You couldn't really say a lot more about them. And so the stories became about the people in Dodge City and the people who came traveling through Dodge. And it started to take on different storylines as well. Um, it was able to last for 20 years, primarily uh, had good writing and had an excellent cast, but it also started to take on the issues of its time. And so you would see Gunsmoke talking about civil rights, civil disobedience, rape, uh, different contemporary issues that could be played out in a Western format. So much like Rod Serling did with these issues and The Twilight Zone, Gunsmoke and these more serious adult westerns were able to do that with these issues and the western. I think another good example of that is uh, Richard Boone's Have Gun, Will Travel, yeah. where he plays the one named uh, person, Paladin. And in real life, Paladin is something of a dandy, very well-dressed, very well-educated, lives in San Francisco, uh, well-off, cultivated, refined, goes to the opera. When he gets an assignment, though, he puts on an all-black outfit with a black hat and a gun that features very prominently in the beginning of each show, where he gives a brief line of dialogue that comes from the, follow the, the upcoming show, which usually conveys something of the idea that don't make me use this gun on you because this gun is finely calibrated to my feel, to my finger. If you do it, you're going to be sorry. I'm warning you. I'm not going to warn you twice. And Paladin was a, was, was a, a Western hero with a difference because he was often... He was often involved in unpopular causes. He might be defending the right of a man to have a, to a right of an accused to have a fair trial. So he comes into town and his job is to deliver the suspect to trial when everybody else wants to lynch him. He may be defending um, Indians. He may be defending females who are moving into the workplace as school teachers or doctors. He's hired by somebody to do a, a job. So he's a gun for hire in that sense. But he's a man with a conscience. And oftentimes, he may even wind up turning against the people who hired him if he feels that uh, they deceived him or that he, he finds out the rest of the story. He, uh, he may defend minors who are having to deal with unfair uh, working conditions. He may have to defend unpopular causes, but it runs for six years. Boone is a tremendously charismatic uh, persona, especially in the first few seasons. And so he takes the Western yet to another level where you're talking about uh, more of these social uh, matters and you're talking about the lone man standing up against the mob. That isn't everything that Have Gun Will Travel is about, but there's that element to it that we haven't seen before.
and paladin was a knight in Charlemagne's court, and also mm-hmm. it's it's a generic uh, name for a knight, someone who takes up a cause. Um, yep, and the, ch- the chess piece is on his business card. Yeah. You know, have gun, will travel, wire paladin, paladin San Francisco. Uh, I wanted to spike one thing about Gunsmoke that I, I think a lot of people have overlooked, and that is um, it's, I think, the first show that I can think of, and maybe I'm wrong, where you see the long-term friendship between a man and a woman, Matt Dillon and Miss Kitty, mm-hmm. uh, and they have a little bit of what would later become popular with Moonlighting and especially with uh, uh, Cheers with Sam and Diane, that, that un, unrealized sexual chemistry. I mean, they, they remain, uh, as far as I recall, there's no scene of them getting romantic or hitting the sheets together mm-hmm. or even the implication. Uh, but you know that they are, in a sense, each other's true love. And for 20 years, they, you know, he never lays a hand on her, as far mm-hmm. as I recall. Um, yeah, and it's, it's interesting. Yeah, it, of course, the, the radio series, and Gunsmoke had been on radio for several years before it went on to television. Um, the radio is a little more adult even than uh, television is in that aspect. In radio, it's certainly implied, if not outright said, that Miss Kitty is a madam, and that many of the women who work in the saloon are her ladies of the evening and that it's a pro- house of prostitution they're not they're not hookers i mean it's a very very um refined place and you can be sure that as a madam he's taking she's taking good care of her girls but look you know you've got a lot of people traveling through you have men on the um with their with, with running their um, herds through uh, for sale you've got people coming through in different ways lots of lots of people come through dodge and it's natural that you're going to have something like that and there was always that suggestion that that kitty was matt's girl yeah. But you never actually saw it portrayed in the radio drama, and of course on television it was going to be unthinkable that you would uh, that that the Long Branch was a house of ill repute. Yeah. So um, you uh, that that aspect of it went away completely, and they did have what you're you're absolutely right in describing a very adult relationship without it being an adult yeah. relationship that is unusual i think for the time in that uh, you have a woman being treated as a confidant as somebody who is a serious adult with ideas worth pursuing so in 58 uh, we've got now eight out of ten the top ten being uh wessons only i've got a secret at number nine and danny thomas at number five are in the top ten you have Gunsmoke at one wagon train at two have gun it will travel at three the Rifleman, Chuck Connors, mm-hmm. number four. Maverick, uh, which is another show that takes the Western in a different direction, yep. uh, at number six. Tales of Wells Fargo, Real McCoys, and then number 10, Life and Legend of Wyatt Earp. Um, I do want to just briefly ask you about both The Rifleman and Maverick, because The Rifleman is the first time we see a Western hero as a father, a single father. Yep. And then Maverick, I don't know if... It, it, Maverick is sort of a, I don't know if I'd say the total spoof, but, but it, it doesn't take itself as seriously. It's sort mm-hmm. of the 1950s version of what Batman might have been had it yeah. had a decade you, earlier. Um, I, I think per, it, particularly in its first year, Maverick kind of straddled the edge between being a comedy and being a straightforward Western. And you, but, but even in that first season, you begin particularly with James Garner because he's that kind of an actor. You begin to see the elements of a show that's not taking itself seriously and of certain characters and characterizations. You see that, that Brett Maverick is somebody who would like to avoid a gunfight if all, if at all possible, which is certainly different from your typical Western hero. That's not to say that he can't handle a gun. He'd prefer not to. And you see him starting to enter some of these, we, we might think of them as scams, a kind of sting-like operations in order to be able to 
get the bad, take the bad guy down, make sure that the good guys are are uh, compensated for whatever they might have lost, but to do it in a non-violent manner. By the second season, I think you begin to see Maverick going into into its full spoof mode, where it starts to satirize shows like Gunsmoke and Bonanza and different shows of the era. Not you know, outright spoofs, satires of them, where you've got um, Jim Backus playing Lauren Green, uh, and he's the, uh, instead of the Cartwrights, they're the real, or the wheelwrights, and instead of the Ponderosa, it's the Subrosa, and instead of of Haas and Little Joe, you've got Moose and Small Paul, and there's no question of what the show is that it's satirizing and Garner and um, and uh, Jack Kelly are wonderful at doing that kind of thing and later on when Roger Moore comes into the show after um, after um, Garner leaves Ma by that time Maverick has become a completely unique genre unto its own but uh, talking about those westerns one thing that I, I had not mentioned previously was that most of these westerns are only half an hour yeah. Gunsmoke was only a half an hour for the, I think, for the majority of its run It 20 years, I think that it wasn't until 64 65, somewhere in there that it goes to an hour so if it, if it didn't spend a majority of its life as a half an hour show it spent a good number of years as a half hour show and what that means for Gunsmoke specifically is it becomes an example of one of the first shows to successfully expand from a half an hour to an hour. And on the, the drama side of it, what it means is that with all of these half hour dramas on TV, uh, between the three networks, you have something like 45, 50 Westerns on at a time. And the reason they can do that is because they are half-hour dramas, but you have an incredible number of westerns on television. Between westerns and, and detective shows, you, you're talking about most of TV at that point. Yeah. So, 1959, though, we see a, a, a pullback, though. The top three shows are Western Sale, Gunsmoke, Wagon Train, Have Gun Will Travel, Bonanza was still a year or two away. Uh, but and the only other one is Wanted Dead or Alive. So uh, while they are still dominating, they're, they're not as necessarily as dominating as mm -hmm. much as it was. You have they're not dominating in numbers. Yeah, yeah. and, and here, here's the interesting part. You have Danny Thomas again, three out of four, the last four years, I think. Red Skelton again pops up like Groucho. Mm -hmm. uh, Another 20-year veteran on yeah. TV. Father Knows Best. Uh, I, it, I'm assuming that this was sort of like the last year of Seinfeld at Cheers where maybe they were, were ready for it to go. 77 Sunset Strip, Sunset Strip. was that, was that a, 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 a P.I. drama? Or? Yeah, yeah. It, was a, it was a Warner Brothers one, yeah. so it was part of the Warner Brothers factory. They had 77 Sunset Strip, Surfside 6, yeah. Bourbon Street Beat, the Roaring Twenties and Hawaiian Eye, and those were all more or less clone shows. And then we have Perry Mason at ten. The surprise for me is that number eight, The Price is Right, at, on NBC. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, Night, yeah, nighttime, just... nighttime game show, yeah. yeah. That um, I think The Price is Right is a unique game show in a couple of ways. I won't spend much time on it, but number one, it had uh, Bill Cullen as the host, and Bill Cullen has always been considered the host's host. As far as game show hosts are concerned, and he was he on was, he was on I Got a Secret, I believe. Uh, yep, he was a panelist those. on I've Got a Secret, and he was the host of uh, of The Price Is Right, and he was the game show host that all the other game show hosts looked up to. He was smooth, he was warm, he was humorous. But The Price Is Right was also the kind of a show that people identified with because they were dealing with. Uh, was something that most people had some understanding of. The retail price of, of goods, groceries, cars, different things like that. So it had an everyman appeal to it. And uh, it was one of the first uh, shows in color on NBC. When it went over to ABC, um, it uh, went back to black and white, ironically. But it had a good, a good run on ABC as well. And um, you see, you're starting to see a sea change that I think you're going to see by... By 1959, by the end of the decade, and we're probably going to talk about that year, but you're definitely going to see a change in programs by then. 
Well, let's talk about it because uh, you want to talk about it. Um, if we compare the beginning, uh, you know, the late 40s to the early 50s, we, we talked about wrestling and boxing uh, dominating and, and some of the live dramas. Uh, then we get, by 1959, we get these shows that are a bit more sophisticated. Maverick, I mentioned Rocky and Bullwinkle in terms of cartoons. Mm -hmm. I'd add in Secret Agent Man slash Danger Man from, uh, from Britain. Um, and mm -hmm. we... we uh, the early 60s especially would have a number of British shows like the Avengers uh, uh, coming in. Um, so it seems that uh, television is getting more mature and a bit more cosmopolitan, even as just a year or two later, uh, it would be slammed as being a vast wasteland. Yeah, yeah you're, you, um, when you're originally looking at television, and we're talking about the idea of exporting television from exporting television shows, and that had been a big part of the appeal with um, a show like uh, like The Honeymooners talking about exporting the American dream. But we're seeing the import-export aspect of television. We're seeing uh, British shows being imported into this country as well as exporting them to Britain. So you, you are seeing something like Secret Agent where you're starting to see a more cynical take on international intrigue than you might have seen before. I think that the single most interesting show to debut in this time period is The Untouchables. Because The Untouchables is another Desilu production and it is the of the, the prohibition era cops and robbers show where you've got Elliot Ness and his untouchable group of agents taking on uh, bootleggers, the Capone gang, uh, historic figures, even though the relationship between uh, history and the untouchables is tenuous at best. As a matter of fact, the FBI got very upset about it at one time because they accused uh, they accused the um, the show of taking cases that the FBI had actually solved and giving them credit to Ness and his Treasury agents. And you also had problems with uh, the stereotype of Italians as being members of the mob. That took a lot of heat. Uh, you know, who was particularly upset about it was Frank Sinatra, who threatened to pull all of his business away from Desilu Studios if they didn't do something to tone it down. He got very angry with Desi Arnaz about that. But The Untouchables is a, a milestone show in its own way because it shows, it be, it's a very violent show for the era. It takes the violence that we saw in the adult westerns to another level. Um, you've got machine guns everywhere. You have the police questioning uh, suspects with clearly... It's the, the, the epitome of the pre-Miranda era, where you've got uh, a very little interest in civil rights. But you, besides these violent aspects of it, which become extremely controversial when Congress again gets involved with hearings into the effect of television on juvenile delinquency, and so you have a lot of debate about the content of The Untouchables, but what, what else you have is The Untouchables becoming something of a prestige drama for all of, of the violence that we've talked about and all of the historical uh, content of it. The Untouchables has always had big guest star names, high production values. It's the first show from Quinn Martin, even though it's the, under the Desilu name. The first season of The Untouchables is, for all intents and purposes, what we would come to see and appreciate as a Quinn Martin production. And so The Untouchables merges quality drama with cops and robbers, with a, a hitherto unspeakable level of violence. And so you see it becoming kind of a talisman of what the shows of the 60s will portend, uh, that, that shows will get more violent, that they will become more graphic, that you will see more of the cops and robbers type law enforcement shows on television. So I think at the end of the 50s, we're seeing that Westerns, while still numerous, are starting to change. We're seeing that variety shows will become more and more star-driven. In other words, shows like the Danny Kaye Show, the Dean Martin Show, 
um, later on the Flip Wilson show. But we'll see shows becoming more identified with their host as opposed to the um, vaudeville type shows that Sullivan had. And we'll start to see the sitcom coming back into its own as an enduring for the time type of television. Yeah, um, it's uh, it's also I think, uh, and we can maybe do a separate show on this about holiday specials and event television. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it, the irony about uh, about what you were saying about Desi Desi Arnaz and uh, Frank Sinatra is just a few years later there were the Joe Valachi hearings that later became a movie, uh, and uh, that was the first uh, exposure of the term mafia, La Cosa Nostra, um, yeah. and and things like that. Um, uh, although I don't think that was on network television, it was spottily here and there across the country, so it didn't get as big as uh, uh, the Army McCarthy hearings. Also, 1959, we had done a whole show on The Twilight Zone. Uh, mm -hmm. That made its debut there. So um, let's just uh, the wrap up here, talk uh, any final thoughts here. Um, where do you think uh, television as a medium uh, was in 1959 to 1960, mm -hmm. uh, and we'll talk, touch more on this in the 60s show. Because um, one of the things I've I think is uh, the idea that it was a vast wasteland w was ridiculous. It was coming into its own. Uh, a few years ago, we did a show with a few other people uh, where I said that I think the 1960s and 70s were the real golden age of television, not now, not the 1950s, mm -hmm. um, in terms of the diversity, just the explosion of the different yeah. types of shows. I think, I think well, and we'll talk about this, you're right, in the 60s, when you talk about Newton Minow's comments on the vast wasteland, you can make a pretty good case on his behalf, and I think we'll see that. But it does, you know, for every Gilligan's Island, which is um, the Minow, in the Gilligan's Island is named after Newton Minow. Um, for every show of Gilligan's Island and this idea of dumbing down television, you're right, you still have some very provocative television out there, some very creative television. I think that by the end of the decade, you're seeing a new maturity in television. Whereas uh, you remember at the beginning of our show, I had mentioned the that um, at the beginning of the decade, you only had 9% of American households with televisions. By 1959, you've got almost 90% of households having television. Um, but by the 60s, you also have that decrease in live programming that I had mentioned at the beginning of the decade, 80% of network television was broadcast live. By the end of the decade, it's closer to 30% that's live. Uh, the dr dramatic anthology series are disappearing in favor of shows with, with uh, half hour and hour long recurring casts. Um, but television has learned how to create its own form of programming. It's not as dependent on radio to carry it over. It's not as dependent on the idea of stars coming over from movies. You have you have uh, stars that television is rightly claiming as its own. We discovered them. We developed them rather than having has been. Uh, movie actors coming on TV. We now have TV stars who are looking to move into movies. Uh, Garner, uh, Paul Newman, Steve McQueen. Uh, television is is coming into its own as more than just a farm system for the for the movies. It's its own form of entertainment. Well, let's end there, and when we pick up uh, in a few weeks or a month or so, we'll talk about the 1960s. So, Mitch, again, always good to talk with you. Same here, Dan. Pleasure.